Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today with State Senator and Majority Whip Tim Keller, uh, who represents the International District in Southeast Albuquerque. Mr. Keller is a Democratic candidate for State Auditor. His future in the Democratic Party must have Republicans sweating a bit as uh, they attacked him a while back when he was considering throwing his hat in the ring for governor, uh, calling him, quote-unquote, uh, breathtakingly and shockingly radical. That's pretty good, I think. Um, he, um, Although he's only 35, he's no longer a young Democrat anymore. Uh, Tim Keller uh, experience is remarkable. He's sponsored and passed lots of good legislation having to do with schools, small businesses, renewable energy, community health, and supporting working families. He's co-founded a social enterprise called Data Digital Divide, which helps uh, Cambodian uh, landmine victims and, and disadvantaged persons in that country. Fast Company magazine ranked it as a top global innovator with many hundreds of employees. It's great to have you here with us today, Senator Keller, and looking forward to this conversation in the New Mexico Mercury Library. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. So could you tell our audience a little bit about um, Data Digital Divide and your district, uh, which, which is District 27, I believe, in the international zone, and how you got interested in Cambodia, and uh, your your history with international uh, uh, relations and dealings. Sure. Uh, Cambodia was an amazing experience for me, and it was really a uh, cold turkey situation. I went over there not knowing a whole lot about the country or really even what I was going to do, but I was at a stage in my life where I was kind of looking for adventure and also wanted to start a, a company, and I had this opportunity to um, set up a, a social enterprise where we'd hire landmine victims and polio victims to do um, databases and websites in oh. Cambodia. And it was the first IT company ever in the country. And, uh, and so now looking back, I mean, we really started the sort of information technology transition in the whole country. Uh, and uh, it's still around. It's Now it's grown beyond what I could have ever imagined. We're in uh, five different countries and have wow. thousands of employees. Mm -hmm. And folks work part-time. And then all the, the, the returns from the business go into paying for them to get a college degree. Uh, and so people kind of move through it. They'll work three or four years, get their college degree, and then move on. So it's, it's a really special program. You also uh, asked about my district. Yeah. Um, my district is a, a special place. Place, I think in our state and in our city and interestingly oddly connected to Cambodia so when I moved back home uh, I was born and raised here when I moved back home uh, to find out that there was a vibrant Asian community including even some Cambodians uh, in the area that I now represent was just a tremendous um, uh, coincidence yeah. and, and something that I really cherish and uh, our area is up in of course the southeast heights we're further east of Knob Hill, so it's really San Mateo and Central going all the way up to Tramway. Uh -huh. And there's 27 languages spoken uh, in the district. And it's really the only place in our state where you get more than three cultures intermixing. You know, we're fortunate <laughs> to even have three. Yeah. But uh, there's a strong Asian population, and the U.S. government actually has been resettling refugees there for decades. And that's why we have um, such diversity. And la the latest... Uh, wave is uh, folks from continental Africa and even some from the Middle East and from Afghanistan. So it continues to get more and more diverse. So I know you have an MBA and I'm wondering, did your, did your interest in, in training people f uh, for digital st uh, startups and agent arise out of, out of your MBA process? Uh, How did you get interested in that? It seems like a, a wonderfully interesting and uh, unexpected interest. Well, I arrived kind of at my career path in backwards in many ways. I was actually in Digital Divide uh, out in Cambodia for three years before my MBA. Oh, and uh, as I was trying to transition back to New Mexico, I actually wanted to move home when I was in Cambodia for all sorts of reasons. I wanted to settle down and get married and have kids and all this. And I couldn't actually find a job. That was the biggest issue. Wow. And so some friends of mine were like, 
hey, why don't you go to grad school? And, you know, I was able to, to, to kind of parlay the experience and the knowledge I've gained in Cambodia to some wonderful, you know, applications and essays and things for graduate school. And so I really used my MBA program as a transition back home to New Mexico. So your district is also um, the site of probably the largest jet fuel spill on an Air Force base in the United States. As you know, there are many dozens, if not 50 or 60, Air Force bases around the country that have this problem. We have a spill of 24 million gallons that seems to be approaching in some, at some unknown speed and, and with uh, some, some unknown capacity uh, to the sweet spot of our, of our whole aquifer. Uh, could you tell me how your, what your response is to the actions that, that the Air Force has taken and in, in, in your view of how state government is handling this uh, th this potential catastrophe in, in Albuquerque? Well, this situation has been a bit like watching a slow train wreck. Yeah. You know, we've had now, I mean, almost 10 years of knowledge and trying to do something about it. And what I think on the, on the positive side, what I've been able to do is really bring together the state and the city and community leaders, even through some legislation that I passed, and really say, hey, let's get the job done and put aside the jurisdictional issues and that kind of thing. But the challenge has been, you know, funding, of course. Uh, the Air Force has been um, moderately generous in, in their efforts to actually finance, you know, getting this stuff out of the ground. Uh, and the state has, in the last few years, done a much better job of being specific about what needs to be done for environmental quality. But the challenge is, you know, we have one of the largest spills, if not the largest spill in the country. And we are hoping and we have modest data that says it's not in the groundwater and so we have some confidence there but the question is you know next year could it be in our groundwater and as soon as that happens of course you have a huge issue there's also a big question about property value you know are these homes in my district impaired uh, because they're sitting on this jet fuel leak and that's what a lot of homeowners are really worried about and that's something that I, I hope it doesn't go this way but you know, you could see a class action lawsuit. As soon as one property is demonstrated as being impaired, uh, all the homeowners in the entire area are going to be involved in that. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to solve the problem before that becomes an issue. But uh, it's something that I would also just add, I think the contractor who's been working on this, over time it's changed and has been really problematic. Mm -hmm. So the actual engineers that have been involved have been way more of a roadblock and a challenge than any entity. In fact, I think the government entities and the community have been relatively playing along, uh, playing nice together and doing what's right. I think the contractor borderline is bilking all these agencies for funding. I mean, they have uh, just stalled and stalled and given excuses after excuses and, you know, subsequent testing and reporting anything to avoid actually investing a ton of money in getting the materials out of the groundwater seems to be the stance. So I've, I've had some issues, of course, with, uh, with this contractor, but they have changed it out, and so we're hoping you know, things will be a little better. So I've been sort of advocating uh, in the Mercury for a while that uh, uh, our U.S. Uh, senators do what probably would have been done when Joe Montoya was here. He would have called hearings uh, and and convened them in Albuquerque. I mean, this is the largest environmental catastrophe that we've had here. Uh, and find out what's going on, how much is, is being spent, what kind of wells we need to actually uh, uh, drill to, to really even characterize the spill in, in a realistic way. Um, I'd like to see that happen. Uh, 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 what's your view on that? Well, we're in a situation where I even had hearings actually on this, and disappointingly, we had four community members That's show terrible. up, and uh, and and none of the media either, you know. So I, I think on on the one hand, because the the disaster hasn't happened, we're worried about it happening. I think it might be difficult to sort of, uh, you know, get the the right level of priority and push to have somebody like a U.S. senator do it. Now that said, you know, I think all across our state and our city. Folks are starved for leadership, and I would certainly welcome any elected official at a higher level uh, to come in and lay down the law and say, we're going to take care of this, and not take care of it in 40 years, which has been the projection. But what does it take to get it down to 10? You know, so people can have a belief 
belief that you know this isn't going to be a problem. I think another challenge is people keep using that term 40 years, and a lot of us are like, well, I mean, in 40 years, who knows? So you know, uh, we'll talk about it later. Yeah. That's been the stance so far. So I guess the next question would be, as you're, as you're talking about these contractors uh, not doing exactly what they might be called upon to do, why do you want to be state auditor? And what is the, what is the nature of, of this job? I'm quite sure a lot of us, myself included, don't really understand the full extent of the powers of that office. Could you explain that to us? Well, the state auditor is a very unique position in a sense that there's actually only 14 states that have something like it. And it's known by even different labels, which actually help describe it a little better. Sometimes it's the inspector general. Uh, sometimes it's a comptroller. It's the auditor general in Pennsylvania. And the idea is that in state government, we should have an independently elected person whose job it is, is to really be a uh, financial overseer of uh, the public dollars that are floating around in the state. And, uh, and I think that's something actually our, our founders of the state were very insightful building in. And it tends to be a very um, anti-corruption uh, structural uh, engine, if you will, in state constitutions. So that's what it's there for. And what that actually means is that uh, the state auditor basically is all the audits for all the entities in New Mexico. So the school boards, uh, the water conservation districts, the acequia associations, the land grants, and cities and counties and state agencies all flow up to the auditor's office. And the auditor's job is literally to say, you know, yes, your books are in order. Uh, and by extension, auditors get into fraud, waste, and abuse. That, that is really the, the, the single, most succinct way to summarize the role. So, you know, you're looking for people who are stealing, got their hand in the till, um, and then you're looking for folks who are abusing the system. So they're using, whether it's gas cards or cars, or they're, you know, uh, using more money than they should from the state. And then there's waste. And the wasted amount of taxpayer dollars at all of these entities, I think think is really where there's a lot of issues uh, in our state and even around the country because you get into things about what is a good use of your tax dollar is it a bunch of testing in our schools uh, is it paying Arizona firms to provide behavioral health services? Um, so this is the way the auditor gets involved in all these issues, whether it's health care or education, uh, even with business development. Are certain tax incentives good or are they bad? Mm -hmm. uh, the auditor, uh, it's part of the auditor's job to basically say this is a waste of our taxpayer money or no, this is a good use of our taxpayer money. So to me, to run for this office, I think, is, is a, a privilege and an office that can have a lot of impact in New Mexico. We're in a situation now where um, Alder Balderas, who's the auditor now, I think has really shown the way towards how this office can be helpful. And I want to go that extra mile to not just go after fraud, waste, and abuse after it happens, but to advocate for policies before uh, fraud, waste, and abuse happens and say, hey, this is a good idea. This is what we should be doing. Or no, this isn't such a good use of our tax dollars. So why don't we take a pass on it? So I have some acquaintances who are, who are um, up in... Clayton and Raton and other places uh, um, um, auditing municipal books. Uh, is that part of, of the auditor's job? I'm beginning to think it is now, but how many actual physical auditors does the state auditor have to work with? It's a big state, lots of territory uh, to cover. It seems like a really a, a monstrous job if you're not well funded. And who, and who funds you? The auditor's office is... Uh, an, uh, functions in an interesting way. The auditor to remain independent actually only audits one or two entities directly every year. And the auditor's office can pick which ones those are. The rest of them are done by outside firms. So your friends in Clayton and Raton, uh, they are retained by the entity, by the city or the county, but they're approved by the auditor. And their work is all essentially checked by the auditor and then the auditor signs off on it. So, I mean, if you will, we actually have kind of an outsourced or privatized auditor office. So the office of the auditor only has about 30 employees. Um, yet it's responsible for audits. Um, the number has, has evolved over time, but uh, it's uh, around 300 plus entities that the auditor's office has to look at. 
So it's a very busy job. And it's one of these where if you're not interested in, you know, state policy and county policy and land grant policy, it's not a good office to run for. <laughs> you know, you've got a real job to do uh, as an auditor. And so uh, you, you spend a lot of time driving around the state and, you know, you often have to deal with uh, whether it's folks who maybe are caught with their hand in the till or it's saying, you know what, there's a better way to do things and here's how I can help. Is the outsourcing in New Mexico a unique situation or do, or do a lot of states do it that way? Each state is very unique with respect to how they do this role. And as I mentioned, there's about 14 states that have a publicly elected position like this. The other states do it either through an appointed position or sometimes they have a legislative committee who does a lot of this work. Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes you see it in New Mexico, it'd be more like the state engineer. It's a very high level you know, semi-independent appointed position. Um, but uh, in terms of, and, and there you get a mix too of staff. So sometimes the Pennsylvania Auditor General, for example, has 300 plus wow. CPAs working and they do everything in-house. Uh, and in New Mexico, you know, we made a decision a long time ago to, to do, by and large, most of it, you know, through firms around the state. And there's pros and cons to it. I mean, on one hand, you know, the gentleman you mentioned in Clayton, it's doubtful he would have another job or a client uh, as a CPA in Clayton, right, right. Uh, you know, other than working with the city. So there's certainly an economic function and it. it allows, I think, for at least some local uh, relationships and connections there, but still with uh, the right amount of oversight. So that aspect of the office seems to have worked pretty good for New Mexico. So as you know, and as our viewers know, the Mercury has been very interested in the behavioral health mess. Uh, and we, um, we've been editorializing and we've been analyzing and we've been thinking about this a lot. We'd love to get your view on what, on what happened on could it have been avoided? Was it a movida in the old sense of the word on on uh, on fifteen uh, honorable practitioners who are suddenly bankrupt and out of work and accused of being frauds? Uh, how do you how do you read this and how would you have done it if you had if you had had the power? Well, this I think has been a real challenging situation for our state and. It's a good example of how not to do an audit. Uh, and of course, this audit came out of the governor's office. Right. And, and I would argue even in general, it should have been in conjunction with the auditor's office from the start. Uh, and, but to some of your questions, you know, number one, in terms of, you know, was there a Movida? I, I think there was. Uh, and it seems more and more as new information is coming to light that, you know, now it seems like the audit was even doctored after it was submitted, uh, you know, and these questions about why it came to be and so forth. Now, that said, I know in the legislature there, there have always been concerns since I've been there about a couple of these firms and about the fact that there might be some shenanigans going on with them. So I think it was a good idea to look at this. And I think there probably was some waste and or maybe fraud in the system. And we'll see how that plays out. But I think We've had hints of that for some time. But the question is, when that happens, you know, what do you do about it? Do you turn off the spigot and kick everyone out of the state and bring in Arizona providers? You know, absolutely not. You give people due process. And I think you also treat each entity uh, the way proportionally their the audit findings, you know, essentially say they should be treated. So if somebody had a bookkeeping error, you go into them and you, you write the books and then you collect on whatever money's owed. Uh, if someone's fraudulent, then you go down the, the penalty front. But to have everyone instantly cut off, I think was very reckless. I think it was dangerous. And I think as a result, a lot of uh, patients were caught up in the wake of it. And when we hear about all these issues with uh, medical records and people not getting the same level of treatment or the confusion of records, this all could have been avoided. And that's what makes me feel like there's something more to this than just a botched audit. There, this was Some of this was intentional for whatever reason. So from my perspective, there's a lot of things we should do about it. But from a legislative perspective and going forward, if I'm auditor, you know, number one is all of these behavioral health contractors are overseen by and responsible to one person, the secretary of uh, that department, and uh, of course the governor who appoints the secretary. There's no legislative formal oversight committee, and there's no board or commission that oversees this. And when you're talking about this amount of money, the hundreds of millions, and if not billions overall, that go through this system, it should be just like other areas of state government where we have a civilian oversight board. 
And so I'm going to try and set that up, uh, whether it's through the auditor's office later in encouraging that or requiring it uh, or through legislation this session. The second thing is to kind of end around on the procurement code. So the way that the administration was able to bring in these Arizona providers was by saying it was an emergency, but then they keep renewing the emergency. And oh. then there's no open bid. There's no chance for other New Mexico providers to come in. And it, it really, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a cheap move. And uh, it, it's anti-New Mexican. And so I think we also need to shore up the procurement code to make sure that people can't abuse that emergency clause. So uh, what kind of... Um what kind of relationship does an auditor of a different party have with the governor of a different party normally? I mean, is this going to be a confrontational situation, uh, uh, presuming that the governor uh, uh, is reelected? Well, I think it's similar to a dynamic, for example, with an attorney general from one party and a, a governor in another party. But, you know, I, I still believe in government. I believe that it can work. And I think in this situation, what, what you'll see is really uh, a mix of both. So in some areas like behavioral health, I think some of this uh, education uh, material and even capital outlay, this issue about when we should release capital outlay and when we shouldn't in the audit, you know, I'm sure there'll be a rub there, but I think that's good because I think, um, you know, at least the folks who elect me are going to uh, appreciate and want, you know, the, my stance on it. And the governor would probably have the same answer. I think what we'll have in common is, you know, things like accountability and transparency, hopefully. You know, I think I think that's something that at least the Department of Finance has They've really helped shore up the IT system and some of the accounting back end, and, and, and that's something I would definitely support. And also, to a certain extent, there are some entities that have never been able to afford being audited or getting their audits done. These are land grants or conservation districts. And that's something where the executive and the auditor's office should really work together and say, you know, how can we do this? Can we have some tax and revenue staff help? Can the auditor's staff help? So, you know, I, I think one thing is we're both in the same branch of government, and you want to make sure that uh, at the end of the day, the right thing gets done, but also that we don't have, you know, some sort of uh, chest bumping exercise. You know, that's something I, I'm not interested in. And I don't think people want the auditor necessarily doing that as well. Uh, they want you just safeguarding the taxpayer dollars and doing what's right. And sometimes you'll agree with the governor and sometimes you won't. Yeah. Before we let this behavioral health, health issue go completely, could you explain a little bit more in a little more depth what the emergency clause in the procurement code is really all about? Well, th this clause is, is fascinating. We've, we have a robust procurement code. Some, including myself, would even say it's a little too robust, meaning it is so convoluted and full of different loopholes and nuances that it can be difficult for folks to do business with the government. However, it's, I would argue, so bad that people tend to use ways to just avoid the procurement code as a whole. So folks are always asking for bills where they're exempt from the procurement code and this kind of thing. And they'll use the emergency clause liberally. And that basically says that, you know, in the event of a emergency, and that's loosely defined, that the executive branch can just hire whoever they want to do whatever they want. And, and that's that loophole. And we've actually narrowed it a little bit last session. We need to go back in and look at it again. So what does that mean? It means that there's no uh, public bid process. So, you know, there's no competitive bid process. So you get a situation where um, services might be more expensive, but also the public's walled out and any competitors are walled out. Uh, you also have a lot of kind of money and politics issues. So the the ties to reporting campaign contributions, conflicts of interest, those are all part of the procurement code. So when you when you use that emergency clause, you're avoiding all of that. Oh. Yeah. So it's very from a accountability and transparency perspective, a good government perspective. I want to see the emergency clause only used when it's truly an emergency. In this behavioral health situation, I would not characterize an emergency. It might be a big problem, but that's different than, you know, the forest fire or something like that. That's what it's intended for. So you wrote a, a really, I thought, a crackerjack uh, essay this morning in the journal talking about testing and about how um, um, private companies have basically made an inroad into, into New Mexico's uh, uh, curriculum. And I'd love you to ramify on that a little bit and, and, um, and give us your view on this whole, this whole sort of very odd and I think very bogus idea about educational reform and 
at least in at least in the way it's being pursued at the moment. Well, education reform, I think, is a, a fascinating story, and it's almost one of uh, analysis paralysis or something like that, where in the 1990s, uh, especially, you know, it was like all of a sudden we have a feeling our education system isn't working, but no one really knows because we didn't have any testing or measurement. Mm. Uh, and so there was a great push uh, to get that, and, it, you know, no child left behind and things like this at the turn of the century. And what that's done is it has now allowed us to measure in, a, in effect how ineffective our education system is. So from that standpoint, I think we can sort of check that box. We can say, okay, we know where we are with respect to each other and internationally. Now, the problem is we continue to do more and more testing. Uh, and it's almost like the, the pendulum has swung too far. And now, in a sense, testing is used as sort of education reform. And it was never intended to be that. It was a means to an end. And now it's become the, you know, the, the end in and of itself. It's just testing for testing's sake. And the more politicians can say we're doing testing, and the more everyone thinks we have more testing, all of a sudden, magically, our education system is supposed to get better. And so I think it's become really a shill for real reform. Uh, and I think, uh, I think, frankly, even politicians and, and academics kind of hide behind it because we're not ready to make some of the real big education choices and deal with some of the real education challenges. So instead of doing that, I'm just going to talk about how we need more testing. And then, uh, you know, we'll get there. And, and that, that kind of logic is what I think is really problematic. And from a student's perspective, you know, I have a new daughter. It's going to be a while till she's in school. But... Uh, if I reflect back on, on my own career, you know, if I had the amount of testing every two weeks that students have now, I mean, there is no way I would have had the educational and career opportunities that I've had because you have to, everyone learns at a different pace and everyone uh, has special needs and things like that. So you've got to have some flexibility in there to allow teachers to teach. And, you know, I think we've just gone too far. I mean, we've gotten away we're not even really educating. We're just, you know, testing. That's what our school system does now. We test and we teach how to take a test. So as we know, when you, when you educate uh, young people to be test takers rather than innovators and adapters and fast-moving, fast-thinking uh, innovators and creators, uh, you are basically hampering uh, your economy. You're hampering their lives. You're cheating them of of the skills that they need in order to operate in a world that is so much more uncertain and insecure than, than the world that I grew up in. So what is, the, what is the connection between a prosperous economy in New Mexico and this kind of widget making and uh, you know, turning students into, into, little, into little machines um, doesn't seem to be good to me. When we think about, as a whole, what we learn in our education system, you know, there's uh, the notion that you need critical thinking skills uh, has completely been lost in this testing aspect. And, you know, the, this over push on, on math and science, I mean, yes, those are important, but uh, so are learning those important social skills. Um, and then the problem solving skills that aren't necessarily on paper. It's about how to think through something and how to structure an argument that you need to make. Uh, the, this is what's being lost. And I think it's a great irony because, you know, in the 90s, the, we, we used to look at Asian uh, communities, for example, or, or Asian countries and say, oh, well, they're just memorizing how to take tests. And, and they would actually agree to that and send their children over to our universities oh. to learn critical thinking and, um, you know, creativity and problem solving because it was such a challenge in that educational environment. And here we are now essentially trying to recreate an Asian model that those countries even agreed didn't really work when you get to the higher education level. So I think also where we're going if we continue this is we'll have a population that has their high school degree with math and uh, reading requirements. But no one who can do, uh, you know, higher level creativity or problem solving skills uh, at, a, at a higher education level. And so, you know, I think what's happening in short is we're really solving for the, the bottom rung. You know, so, you know, what, what is the price of getting everyone up to a minimum level? Well, right now the way we're doing it, the price is you're eliminating everyone who might be at a higher level. And I think that's a, that's a real tragedy and that's something the U.S. has got to figure out soon. 
So as we've as we've talked, we've connected education uh, to to jobs in the economy in, a, in an indirect way, and and as an auditor, uh, you will be looking at the at the problem solving skills of many government employees uh, who really have to deal with the world in its fastest and most uh, problematic way. Oftentimes, what is what is your view as a as a man who's worked all over the world and now wants to to look at our and how we spend our money. What is your view on New Mexico's economy and on jobs? Well, there's a few aspects to this, and I think one is that we we have to do a couple of things very different than we're doing it now. We talked about the education aspect, and that our workforce simply is not the kind of uh, it doesn't have the right skill set for the kind of jobs we want to create. So right now we're going down a path of being the low-cost labor provider for the rest of the country. Uh, and if we continue to sort of um, rote memorize uh, testing-driven education through high school, that's what we're going to end up. And so we can't forget higher education here. And it plays a very critical role. And the challenge, I think, really around jobs is we also have to think bigger you know, for at least two decades in New Mexico, we've tried one-off ideas, you know, a spaceport or, uh, you know, you name the tax bill that we tried. But there's been no coherent economic development plan that's lasted past a given elected official. And frankly, the, the private sector, who I work with a lot, I think would agree, their idea of what we need in our state is also changing in a similar way. Instead of tax tweaks here and there, you know, we need a plan and it's got to be private sector driven. So it withstands the political currents. And a good example of this, I think, is Pittsburgh. Uh, they had a plan that lasted for 10 years. And as soon as the private sector agreed to it, the politicians just jumped on board and, you know, they were falling over themselves to help make this plan work. And I think in our situation, we keep looking to elected officials and so forth to have, you know, some sort of idea it doesn't really pan out. So then we settle for small change. And in our situation, we need 160,000 jobs just to get back to where we were in 2007. That is not going to happen with, you know, a tweak in a tax policy here or, you know, getting a, a particular company to move here. And so I think for me, it's I, I want to continue to push the status quo and hold ideas accountable for the real impact they're going to have. You know, is this going to create 100 jobs? Well, that's nice. That's 100 new jobs. But let's not pretend it's going to create 160,000. Well, I wish we had more time to continue with this. Perhaps you'll come back uh, before the election and talk some more. It's been a real pleasure talking with you, Tim, and I'm awfully glad to have you here in our library. Well, it's so special to be here. Thank you for inviting me, and also thank you for all you do just to keep uh, the public informed and uh, for will your willingness to go in-depth on these issues.